This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. World leaders are gathering today here in New York for a one-day U.N. Climate Action Summit. Dozens of world leaders are planning to address the summit, but President Trump is skipping the gathering. Instead, he plans to attend a U.N. event focused on religious freedom and religious persecution. Meanwhile, the World Meteorological Organization has just released an alarming new report warning that the five-year period from 2014 to 2019 is the hottest on record, marked by accelerating sea level rise and soaring carbon emissions. Today's summit comes three days after four million people took part in a global climate strike. And the protests are continuing. Climate activists in Washington, D.C., are attempting right now to block morning rush hour traffic. As we continue our climate coverage, we turn to Bill McKibben, the longtime journalist co founder of 350.org. Bill McKibben's 1989 book, The End of Nature, was the first book for a general audience about the climate crisis. His other books include. Falter, has the human game begun to play itself out? His latest piece for The New Yorker is going viral. Its headline, Money is the Oxygen on Which the Fire of Global Warming Burns. He also recently had the cover story of Time magazine, his piece called Hello from the Year 2050. We avoided the worst of climate change, but everything is different. Bill McKibben, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us after your journey to Washington in Congress last week for all that was happening there, then in the streets here in New York on Friday for the global climate strike. Talk about your experience of this. Well, look, Amy, I've had the privilege of getting to be a part of every one of the global mobilizations over the last 10 years, and Friday was really different. It was a quantum step up in numbers, but also uh, Spirit, uh, you know, you were down in down at the battery, and your crew did an amazing job. Uh, it was all ages, and it looked like New York. It was as diverse as this city, and the same was true all over the world. It was such a privilege to get to have 350 kind of help out behind the scenes around the planet, because we got to look at these pictures as they were flooding in from everywhere. I, you know, there were a couple of times when. I, I, an old guy, I don't cry easy, but there are a couple of times when I. There was a picture from Kabul uh, in Afghanistan. A girls' school walked out um, in protest. They, of course, it's dangerous, so there were soldiers front and back of them. But just to think about that for a minute, I mean, it's brave for a girl to go to school in Kabul, much less to not go to school and to walk out. There were remarkable pictures from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, from across the South Pacific. Uh, the earliest pictures were coming in from the Solomon Islands, from people arriving to strike by canoe, a dugout canoe. You know, I mean, just. I mean, didn't something like 300,000 Australians protest as the prime minister, the Australian prime minister, is meeting with Trump in Washington, D.C.? That's right. Uh, Scott Morrison was having state dinner with Trump, but there were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Australians, some of the biggest demonstrations down under ever. And, uh, by the way, uh, this coming Friday, uh, there's a uh, Parts of the world that are going to have uh, didn't didn't do it last Friday. You're doing it this Friday. So watch for the pictures from New Zealand, from Spain, in Canada. We think there'll be three or four hundred thousand people in Montreal alone. So there's more yet to come in this remarkable, remarkable. Action. In New York, so many young people were going out from their classes that the New York Public Schools administration had to announce they could leave and they wouldn't be marked absent. That's right. I think actually the city was. Proud to do it. Um, and clearly, for kids all over the place, this wasn't a day for no education. This was a day when people were learning all kinds of things and teaching all kinds of things. It was education at its best. Mm. I mean, as I went to Boston on Friday, coming out at the government's, uh, uh, government center metro, um, Thousands and thousands, you know, the young people holding signs, the oceans are rising, and so are we. I mean, they're. Um and then they marched to Boston Common. And that was just one little example exactly. all over this country. Exactly. No, it, it, it was 
beautiful. And what it demonstrates is, you know, as the World Meteorological Organization points out, we're at a tipping point physically, you know. Uh, the planet really is starting to break in profound ways. We're also at a tipping point, maybe, politically. There's finally enough recognition, enough demand for action, that maybe things will start to happen. Now, how that race between destruction and hope comes out is anybody's guess. It really depends on how quickly we're able to mobilize. So, I wanted to ask you about Washington last week. Yes. Um, you had Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old climate activist, addressing, or you could say dressing down, um, the Congress members. I want to turn just to a small clip of Greta testifying. My name is Greta Thunberg. I have not come to offer any prepared remarks at this hearing. I am instead attaching my testimony. It is the IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, the SR 1.5, which was released on October 8, 2018. I am submitting this report as my testimony because I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the scientists. And I want you to put, unite behind the science. And then I want you to take real action. Thank you. Greta Thunberg uh, speaking before part of the House Foreign Relations Committee. So Bill McKibben, you were there. A few minutes later, this was my favorite moment. You know, as usual, the congressmen who can't help themselves are just gassing on for minute after minute, uh, unable to take a cue from Greta's concise eloquence. Uh, one Republican, uh, just on and on and on, China this, China that, why should we do anything, China's not doing anything, yada, yada, yada. It goes on like this for five minutes, and Greta looks up at him and says, uh, just, she said, I, I come from a small country called Sweden. In Sweden, sometimes people say, why should we do anything, because the United States is so big and wastes so much. Just so you know. <laughs> it was my favorite moment of congressional testimony in a long time. So, I wanted to go, speaking of schools, to the divestment movement, because there was massive news last week after the University of California voted to divest from fossil fuel companies, writing in The Los Angeles Times, two top university investment officials said it was the long-term risk posed by fossil fuel investments, rather than concerns over the environment, that led them to pull some $150 million in fossil fuel assets from the university endowment. In fact, isn't it bigger, something like $80 billion? Well, the endowment the endowment and portfolio of the, uh, of the University of California system and the pension fund is $80 billion. This is the biggest educational uh, uh, divestment ever and from the biggest education, public education system on the planet. Such a shout out to the students, professors, alumni who for seven years have waged a absolutely in your face, unrelenting campaign. This is a huge deal. And the way they announced it was actually sort of quite helpful. They said, yeah, we, I mean, they clearly didn't want to acknowledge how much work had been done. But they're like, yeah, you know what? We're losing our shirt on fossil fuel. Uh, we can't keep doing this, so we're out of here. And that message rings loud and clear. Uh, we're now, we passed last week the $11 trillion mark on divestment. There's a big gathering for people who are in New York Thursday night at Riverside Church, beginning at 7, to talk about, you know, to sort of hear about all that's going on with the divestment and finance movement. There'll be some more big surprise announcements there of some really interesting developments. But this campaign, you know, has, ha has just keeps burgeoning. And now, as you said, we're ready to go to the next step, uh, uh, not just the fossil fuel companies. It's time to head-on deal with the banks and insurance companies and asset managers that are providing the lifeline to this fossil fuel industry. So, talk about the universities that are still grappling with this. So, you have UC out. That's going to put enormous pressure right. on the, other institutions. Oh, the guy who was saddest to hear the news was doubtless the, you know, president of Harvard, because they've been, they and Yale and everybody else have been, oh, we don't, we can't do this. None of the big universities will do it. Well, the biggest of all has now weighed in. I mean, it's not like the University of California is some fourth-rate 
enterprise. They've won 62 Nobel Prizes. You know, it's one of the great research institutions in the whole world. And they've taken seriously what their scientists said. So now they're out of climate change stock. So you mentioned the role banks are playing in financing the fossil fuel industry. You cite in your pieces the largest bank um, in the U.S., J.P. Morgan Chase. Talk about the banks and sure. the insurance industry and the role they play. Sure. Rainforest Action Network and others have done great work over the last few years in digging up all the data to highlight what's going on. In the years since Paris, the four big U.S. banks, Chase, Wells Fargo, Citi, B of A, have dramatically increased their lending to the fossil fuel industry. Chase is number one with a bullet, as one of the Rainforest Action Network activists said. They lent, over the last three years, $196 billion. So if the guy who runs Exxon is a sort of carbon giant, so is Jamie Dimon, the guy who runs Chase. I mean, they're pouring money into the destruction of the planet. They're doing everything they can to make a profit off that destruction. We've got to figure out how to stop that, and I think we will. In your um, Time cover story, you wrote, let's imagine for a moment we've reached the middle of the century. It's 2050. We have a moment to reflect. The climate fight remains the consuming battle of our age, but its most intense phase may be in our rearview mirror. And so we can look back to see how we might have managed to dramatically change our society and economy. We had no other choice. Explain uh, this look back. So Time asked me to try and imagine a world that actually worked. That's not easy, because an incredible number of things have to go right from this point on. But if we did everything right from this point, if we cut off the supply of money to the fossil fuel industry, if we passed something like the Green New Deal and implemented it fast, if we did everything necessary to keep fossil fuel in the ground, then we're not going to stop global warming. That's off the table. But maybe we can limit it to the point where it doesn't cut off our civilizations at the knees. That's a close question. But if we do, not only will the—if we do those things, not only will the planet survive, our civilizations survive, but there's a reason to think that they could thrive, too, that the world that we create will be, above all, a world where we've escaped some of the incredibly damaging hyper-individualism of the kind of consumer society we live in now, and replaced it necessarily with a kind of ethic of solidarity. Uh, that's what it's going to take, because we're now in a survival challenge. Uh, did uh, Nancy Pelosi meet with Greta Thunberg in Congress, the Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, who, uh, when mocking the, the Green New Deal, talked about the Green Dream or whatever they call it? I think they met briefly, and, and, and Chuck Schumer had a bunch of young climate activists in and things. I wouldn't hold my breath for Congress next week passing the Green New Deal. I do think that there are promising signs out on the campaign trail that the people contesting for the Democratic primary have had no choice because of the outpouring of, of feeling around this to really begin to dramatically reevaluate what the Democratic Party is going to do in the future. The U.N. Climate Action Summit is taking place today. What's going to happen at the U.N.? And what about the fact that President Trump, a proud climate change denier, is not attending? Well, uh, truthfully, if I were him, I wouldn't have gone either, because you would have heard the longest, lustiest boos that any world leader ever got. Um, you know, the 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 UN's not going Last to year solve. Last he was laughed at, and this year he would have. The, the UN's not going to solve the climate problem, but it is important that the Secretary General is doing his best to crack the whip. He told countries they weren't going to be allowed to talk if they were still opening new coal plants. He told the Japanese and others, "You guys, sorry, you're actually not going to get up and speak." It's a sign that even a place as diplomatic as the UN has begun to reach the end of the tether here. And we will be playing on Democracy Now! Greta Thunberg's speech before the U.N. General Assembly today. She is going to address them. And the um, U.N. Secretary General said, you can only speak about your solutions. Is that right? That's it.
Um, uh, we're going to ask you to stay with us for a moment. We're going to post online at democracynow.org to get your assessment of the presidential candidates um, uh, and their positions on climate, the climate crisis, global warming and the Green New Deal. That does it for our show. Bill McKibben, co-founder of 350.org. His latest book is Falter, Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out? Special thanks to our digital fellow, Julia Thomas, who is also in the streets of New York City. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.